time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Alan Hu Foundation Mental Health Lecture Series. I am Chi Chin Hu, co-founder of Alan Hu Foundation and the host for your webinar. Today, Dr. Victor Carrion will present Harnessing Brain Adaptability. Before moving forward, I want to thank the Mental Health Association for Chinese Community for providing simultaneous Chinese interpretation. I will speak Chinese to briefly explain how to use the language interpretation. 大家好,欢迎参加Alan Hu Foundation 精神健康讲座系列。很感谢美国华医精神健康联盟提供中文口译。如果您想听中文，请按下口译的地球符号，然后点选中文。若只想听中文口译，请点选关闭原始音讯。如果您使用手机收听，您可以点选表示更多的那个符号，点选口译，点选中文。您还可以点选关闭原始音讯，最后点
I'm going to turn to Dr. Carrion. Thank Dr. you. Carrion, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. I, I really want to thank the Allen Hu Foundation, not only for inviting me uh, to give this talk, but for really connecting all of us. Connectedness is a very important part of what I'm gonna talk about. And you know, one of the terms that I really have disliked <laughs> this year is this social isolation, uh, which really uh, is physical distancing is a better term, but we don't want to be isolated socially. So thank you, Alan Hu Foundation, for connecting all of us uh, today. I am going to start by sharing uh, my slides. Let me see if I can get this done. Right, uh, let me stop sharing here. Okay, and you can all see that? Yes, I can see it. Okay, and you know, today we're gonna talk about adaptability. And, and we are all very familiar with the term that we call resilience, right? The, the kind of bouncing back to our normal state, a physics uh, type of term. But sometimes when we bounce back, we don't bounce back exactly where we were. We bounce back to another spot, to another place. And that place may actually be better than where we were before. And we uh, call that adaptability. And, and that is the goal of what we're going to do. Once again, I feel very honored of being here in such an important month, uh, the Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, which is shared, I have to say, with the Mental Health Awareness Month. So, so this is a time to commemorate, but it's also a time to remember that this happens every year. And that means that we have work to do and we have work to do for years to come. As, as you all know, the celebrations really are clouded by the violence that we have seen in the past few months in the United States and even before then. Um, so we have to keep at it. We have to keep remembering how much uh, the cultures, the Asian culture and the Pacific Islander cultures have contributed to what America is today. And we have to do that in part with mental health mental health, not only for AAPI, but mental health for the nation. So with that in mind, let me discuss what uh, we're going to discuss today, which is I'm going to start with some general remarks about stress, because we all have different thoughts about it. So, so I want to share what mine are. And, and then some work, some research that we've conducted for the past 25 years on the biological markers of stress early in development and how those have influence in the brain structure and the brain function during development. What that means is that if the brain is vulnerable to something that can happen outside, that means that if something good happens outside, that's also going to influence the brain. And that's because there is neuroplasticity. So we'll talk about neuroplasticity and how to take advantage of that and how we have done that in my lab with uh, treatments and with prevention interventions. And then lastly, uh, we'll all engage in some exercise in, in terms of how can we become more adaptable cognitively in terms of what we think and emotionally in terms of how we feel. The first thing to say about stress is that stress is not inherently a negative thing. In fact, we actually need stress to develop a lot of our systems, including the immunological system. If we don't care about that exam that, we're, that we have tomorrow, we'll probably fail. <laughs> so actually the more stress that we have, the better we perform, the happier we are, the better our health is, but only to an optimal point. Uh, after that optimal point, what we see is that the performance, the happiness, the health, start to decline. And I am going to be talking about, and I have started talking already uh, about when I mentioned violence, that second uh, half of the an inverted U-curve uh, shape curve and the cost that that has for our physiology. 
this is an example of something that would be uh, on that second half of the curve. This is a picture from a child that has been exposed to water. And you see, is, is, you would say it's just a drawing, but if you look at the faces of, of the children, you can see the expressions of horror and really non-enjoyment in terms of what's happening. This child probably not only experienced war, but experience family separation, experience hunger, experience threat. And we all call that the, this accumulation of stressors an allostatic load. Uh, so we don't only respond to the fire or to the earthquake or to what happened last week, but we respond to what we carry with us as like a backpack uh, most of the time. And like a backpack, we can we tend to really be able to carry it, right? In the same way that we regulate our temperature, we can regulate how much stress we have. But if that backpack gets too heavy, it starts ripping apart. And if you're six, seven, eight years old, you may even fall backward. Other examples of violence are man-made, right? Here we have a picture from a child about 9-11. This is a child that actually never drew uh, during sessions, but when 9-11 happened, it was the only thing he could do. It was the only way that he could express what he had witnessed. So we have two examples of man-made terror and man-made stress and man-made trauma, war, terrorism, and then there's natural disasters. This is a four-year-old girl from Haiti after a massive uh, earthquake there in 2008, I believe. And here, she's really depicting how she and her sister went, were found in the rubbles uh, of what was their home. And they were the only survivors at that time. And then there's sexual abuse, physical abuse, witnessing violence, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today and the data comes from children that have experienced interpersonal violence. And to them, I thank, I thank them for our knowledge and the knowledge that we share with you. And of course, this world pandemic that we have all been experiencing during this past year and continue to experience at accelerated rate in, in, in many different countries and diffusing further as we speak into areas of Asia. So the whole battle between gene and the environment and how we manage stress, it's, it's really over. <laughs> it's, it's really not nature versus nurture, right? We know that genes and environments interact to alter our stress vulnerability. And depending on that, stress vulnerability of ours, we may develop conditions, we may become resilient, we may become adaptive, but just because we are resilient and adaptive today doesn't mean that we're gonna be resilient and adaptive tomorrow. If we think of a threshold, right? Where after the threshold, psychopathology is developed or symptoms or dysfunction or you name it, anything, any type of problems happen after that, individuals that are very far from there can get closer and closer as that backpack gets heavier and heavier. Our job then is to lighten that backpack up, decrease that allostatic load. So what happens when we are on the second part of the curve? Uh, what happens is that we have a system called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that secretes cortisol. And I'm gonna be talking about that in a second. But here's an example of when allostat what an allostatic load does. It does affect uh, our physiology, and then that creates individual differences that we pass through our subjective perception of what we are experiencing and it alters our behavioral responses. And consequently, those behavioral responses like fight or flight or freeze can alter further the physiological response. So by the end of the talk, I hope that you grab a, a little bit of a concept of this uh, with the material that I am going to present. 
Um, just to let you know, before the pandemic, this is CDC data uh, from 1999 to 2016, the national suicide trends in Americans aged 10 and above were considerably high. And, and we were having this other pandemic, really, because it's worldwide, of, of suicide in youth. Uh, the data this year is really uh, not that well recorded. So we actually don't know what very well what has happened in, in 2020, but I can tell you this is how the data look before that. Uh, so this is reason for alarm. This is reason for concern for all of us. And, and really a call to action. Something needs to be done. As children are developing their brain, a hundred billion neurons are forming. There are trillions of synapses, of pruning, of myelination that's taking place. I mean, it's, it's really a miracle when things don't go wrong because there, there's so many uh, possibilities here for something to get derailed. And that allostatic load, that backpack, does its job in really trying to alter this de uh, development. Let me tell you a little bit about the mechanism uh, of how that happens. Um, on the top of our kidneys, we have some glands called the adrenal glands. Those adrenal glands secrete a hormone that helps us manage stressors. So if we're crossing the street and there's a truck coming at us and we jump, that's the adrenal gland secreting a lot of uh, cortisol so that we can get out of there. And that it involves the epi, uh, epinephrine system and other systems as well. But the cortisol is a big part of this. The message of when to release that cortisol comes from the brain, comes from the hypothal hypothalamus. And then that goes um, to the anterior pituitary. And then the anterior pituitary secretes another hormone that tells the adrenal gland, okay, secrete cortisol. This is what we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And our cortisol goes high even when we have lunch, right? When we have lunch, that's a minor stressor for our system. So the cortisol helps us with digestion. Um, but if you are a little kid or if you're an adult and you feel like a truck is coming at you day after day after day after day, that has a toll because this adrenal gland has to keep secreting this cortisol. And that sends messages to the brain to shut the system down. And when the system shuts down, then that causes illness and it affects the immunological system and, and cardiovascular system and, and other systems, endocrinological system as well of our body. Now, we know from animal research that cortisol secreted in high amounts in animals is called corticosterone, uh, can actually be neurotoxic. What that means is that it can actually kill neural cells this was of a lot of concern to me in terms of children that were experiencing stress and trauma. And as early as 2002, I started looking for levels of cortisol in children that had post-traumatic symptoms after experiencing many of these uh, events that I have talked about. And what we see in comparison to the no, uh, healthy kids with no psychiatric symptoms is that there's a normal circadian rhythm, right? A diurnal variation that is pretty similar in both groups. But that groups with post-traumatic symptoms, the green line had higher levels of cortisol. And that wasn't surprising to me because you may perhaps need more cortisol if you're being stressed. But this pre-bedtime level here at the end was significantly higher. And as the years went by and we kept accumulating data and look, looking at it with better uh, statistical methods, that pre-bedtime elevation of cortisol became really a biological marker of children that acutely have experienced trauma and have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. I say acutely because chronically the picture uh, changes and sometimes you don't have you know, cortisol, which is the picture that we see in adults that have started their trauma history early in life. Now, while it's high, my concern was, 
if this has the potential, if cortisol has the potential to be neurotoxic, what is this hormone doing to the brain? Specifically, what is it doing to areas like the prefrontal cortex uh, where, where we really process our executive function? We organize uh, there, right? And our limbic system where the amygdala, the center core of emotion lives, and also the hippocampus where we process memories. And not only these isolated regions, but how they all communicate, right? These frontal striatal and frontal limbic pathways, how are they affected? So I was looking at these areas specifically for two reasons. One, because these are functions that we see behaviorally being affected in children that have chronic post-traumatic symptoms, but also because these regions happen to have a lot of receptors for cortisol. So they act, cortisol actually gravitates towards these regions. So let's talk a little bit about what we found here. So the first time that we looked at this, we looked at cortisol. And when we looked at the structure, meaning like a Polaroid of, of, of the hippocampus, there was not much to be seen cross-sectionally. And National groups were looking at this, but one thing that my group did is that we actually look at it longitudinally through time. And there was a very insidious effect of the cortisol in how the hippocampus would grow through time. So it wouldn't grow as much when the hippocampus was there. And further, when we did not structure, but functional imaging, MRI, and we actually gave a task of memory, we can see here the yellow demonstrating the increased performance of the individuals that are healthy and do not have post-traumatic symptoms in comparison to those that have post-traumatic symptoms. And, and here we see in a, in a graph also the difference between uh, both of these. The prefrontal cortex uh, is also an area that has a lot of cortical receptors and it really works as the break of that limbic system. So when there's emotion, you can see the, the amygdala firing up, memories from the hippocampus working with that. Sometimes there's only connections of one nerve cell between the two of them. That's why sometimes when we remember something, it gives us an emotion or an emotion may, be, may bring us a memory. And if, if that is too much of a reaction that we're getting like in fight or flight or freeze, the prefrontal cortex wants to control that. So it is like the break. It is a little bit more complicated like, than that because now we are also finding that it's bi-directional, but it can actually go the other way. The limbic system can tell the prefrontal cortex, no, you <laughs> calm down uh, in a way. But we have also found areas of the prefrontal cortex that correlate with cortisol, meaning that the higher the cortisol, the smaller the volume of specific prefrontal cortex areas. And then when we do functional imaging and, and do a task of emotion, we can see that very early, the children that have PTSD symptoms activate um, their amygdala significantly more than the healthy children. And you may ask, well, why isn't the prefrontal cortex coming and acting as a break? And we look at the, you know, at the prefrontal cortex is not as active, right? Those areas that have been affected by cortisol may actually may be affecting the function of the prefrontal cortex to calm the amygdala down. And you can see the activity of the prefrontal cortex in healthy children in the green line. So, uh, there is a lot more in terms of what happens in the brain. And my good friend Carl Wins and I have written a text on the neuroscience of pediatric PTSD. And that's a, a summary of all the work that has been done in this area. It's not that thick because there's not that much. But uh, there are definitely biological correlates of neuroscience. But the point that I, that I really want to make is that the reason this is happening is because areas like the limbic system and the cortical areas are very plastic. So that makes them vulnerable. But that's only one side of the coin. Let's look at the other side of the coin. If, if trauma 
and stress and traumatic stress, if, if trauma is teaching us that the, cort the cortical part of the brain and the limbic system are responding to the environment, how can we use that to our advantage? Especially how can we use it to our advantage when we know that executive function, the function of the prefrontal cortex and emotion regulation, a function of the frontal limbic pathways is particularly altered. If I want to treat kids then that have this experience, I am going to develop an intervention that targets both executive function and emotion regulation to take advantage of neuroplasticity, especially early in life. And this is why the role of prevention and early intervention is so important because neuroplasticity is most active during this part of development. Um, we know that there are th things that promote neurogenesis. Aerobic exercise promotes neurogenesis. Uh, stimulation promotes neurogenesis. And the best improvements happen to be in these two areas, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And this, this neurogenesis doesn't exist only in isolated regions like I'm presenting right now, but really in synapses, connections between neurons, and also in pathways, networks in the brain by either strengthening it, strengthening them, or weakening them. So how, can, how did we take advantage of that neuroplasticity was the development of an intervention called q Center Therapy for Youth Experiencing Post-Traumatic Symptoms that enhances emotion regulation and executive function and really putting it to the test. What's happening to these networks? What's happening um, to these regions while the kid is going through this intervention that is like a three month intervention that has a number of steps where they first get educated on what trauma is, what PTSD is, then they learn coping mechanisms, then they create a narrative of their life story, then they identify triggers. And I'm going to present a case where I take you through the treatment of a kid that went through something like this. Uh, this manual that exists now for therapists also was translated into Spanish by a Spanish press and is, is being used in Spain and we've done trains in Puerto Rico and other areas as well. But it, there's two randomized controlled trials. It does decrease PTSD symptoms, either child score or parent score. It does decrease anxiety symptoms. And I really like this chart here because it talks about the importance of education, just learning. Just knowing that you are not crazy, that you are not bad, that you are not a problem, but that your body is responding in the same way that any of us could respond at any time to traumatic stress is healing, right? I call it empowerment through knowledge. So the biggest slope of decline of symptoms, as you can see here, is at the beginning. And at the beginning, there's nothing terribly sophisticated happening there. We're basically teaching the children what classical conditioning is, which I'll talk to you about that too in a minute. But in terms of what's happening to the brain while this therapy is happening, we know from previous work that areas of the prefrontal cortex become also hyperactivated when there's a lot of these symptoms. And these symptoms are really incapacitating. They affect academic life, they affect emotional life, they affect interpersonal relationships, they are nighttime intrusions. And as, as, as I mentioned earlier, they can even lead to suicide uh, and suicidal ideation. So through a mechanism called functional near infrared spectroscopy, something that is more portable than an MRI and that you can actually do in a clinic, we know that those children that uh, go through the Q center therapy treatment have decreased activation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that area that is associated with the symptoms. And, and you may say, well, but can you just see them doing better? Do you really have to do this uh, invasive uh, or semi-invasive uh, procedure? 
And the reason that we do it is one, to, to increase the empirical evidence of the protocol, but also to predict treatment outcome. Neuroscience changes happen before behavioral changes. So this decrease here in dorsolateral prefrontal cortex activity may be happening even before the symptoms improve, but it's telling us that the symptoms are going to improve. So I mentioned classical conditioning, and, and we all go through this. It's, we are very simple animals. <laughs> we learn only two ways, through something that is being reinforced and not reinforced, or through this classical conditioning, where our brain associates things that they have experienced before and responses we've had before with things that we're gonna have in the future, cues or triggers. So an unconditional stimulus, for example, could be a fire, and an unconditioned response would be to run away, right? Which is very adaptive. But a year later, uh, a condition, now it's conditioned stimulus, may not be a fiber, but maybe the smell of smoke that someone is doing a barbecue at the end of the street, but I start running and I start running right away. I take my behavior that was adaptive, which is very understandable, right? Because it did save my life at one point, but now it's maladaptive. And, and that requires some relearning. And notice how I say relearning and not unlearning because we're not great at unlearning things that we have learned. And this has treatment implications because we don't want sometimes to have kids stop doing certain behaviors, but we want to teach them competitive behaviors with the behaviors that are causing problems to them. So cue center therapy helps the child pay attention to triggers, to cues, uh, emphasize self-efficacy, empowerment, it engages coaches when available, uh, but they don't necessarily have to be available. And it teaches them about uh, these relationships between what we think, what we feel emotionally, what we feel physically, and our behavior. And these are squares, and we create squares. And you know, we don't have time to go through the whole treatment protocol. Maybe in the future we will. But I'll take you through a case study and maybe this will help uh, illustrate a little bit what I'm talking about. But Sammy was a kid, an 11 year old boy who was brought to our clinic because of increased aggression toward his siblings. Mom reported that this was very uncharacteristic of Sammy's previous demeanor. She also reported decreased academic performance. Feeling guilty and confused, she reported to the authorities that Sammy's father had regularly abused her and the children physically and emotionally for a number of years. Sammy had been hit numerous times with metal bars, wooden rods, and bamboo sticks. Sammy's mother felt the boy's behavior was directed at her for breaking the family up. Mom and kids were now living in a new apartment. Father had been arrested and deported, and Sammy had nightmares and difficulty sleeping and score with moderate symptoms of PTSD. So what this story tells us is that trauma is complex, right? Trauma has secondary trauma associated with it. And Sammy put this in very good words. Uh, when the father was arrested and deported, he said he felt relief, right? Because the physical abuse had stopped. But also, not all the time was negative with the father, right? Sometimes they used to go to the park. Sometimes they used to go and have ice cream. And, and that's also that's, that was also gone. Um, as you can see, there's a lot of guilt in the mom because she wasn't sure what to do. And one of the things that we have identified also is that guilt is a significant predictor of individuals that are going to develop PTSD versus those that do not. So if we really want to target something early in treatment, we really go after that guilt. But triggers, condition stimulus can really be neutral. They are not negative things. So for mom, Sammy was a cue, was a trigger. And for Sammy, mom was a cue, was a trigger. And this needed to be addressed with psychosocial intervention, with therapy. There's no known drug or medication that can take care of that. So at first we did education into PTSD symptoms and this uh, helped uh, Sammy with his nighttime episode. This is that education that I was talking about earlier. And then before we get into the story, we really want them to be equipped with coping tools. 
and he learned some relaxation exercises, which is part of what we do. And when he felt more comfortable, then he told his, his story. He now felt safe, uh, but he also missed his father, as I mentioned. Uh, and the aggressive episodes, during the aggressive episodes, he felt confused as in a daze, his heart rate would accelerate. And after taking out his feelings on his siblings, he will feel guilty and ashamed. Now, how do we know that this is not just Sammy, right? So one important thing about trauma is that there's a behavior change. This was an OA student who had a good relationship with his siblings. And then there was this drastic change after uh, the trauma. As the sessions went on, they were introduced to the concept of cues, the fact that they were, were mostly neutral and self-efficacy is very important here. The therapist doesn't give you all the cards, but Sammy discovers himself that the sound of the car when mom comes home, the, the closing of the door, it's a cue, it's a trigger because it reminds him of that coming home. And then the arousal would ensue in him. And, and, you know, mom and him were like, well, should we get rid of the car? And I'm like, no, no, there's nothing wrong with the car, right? The car is a cue, it's a trigger, and we're actually going to use it. So we go through a process of exposure uh, that goes into stages where we use this imaginary sound of the slamming of the car, then the slamming of the office's door, and then the actual car in vivo so that he can desensitize his physiological response. Eventually, Sammy was able to make a connection between his history and his behavior and his emotions. Kids sometimes are aware of all of those, but they are living silos, very compartmentalized. And, and the, the center therapy helps them put them all together. By termination, he was feeling better at school, not arguing with his mom, not hitting his siblings, and he felt that many of these core issues had been now, what do we do? This is when children are already going through trauma and they're already experiencing symptoms. But what do we do for youth when we want to prevent them from even reaching that point, right? Well, we developed a program on yoga and mindfulness. This was a partnership with Pure Edge and we built together something called the Pure Power Curriculum, which we incorporated in the curriculum of a whole school district, having a similar school district as a control group, and really uh, did the study longitudinally, and, and it was multi-method, looking at that cortisol, looking at brain structure and function, looking at sleep quality, lots of information there. We're still getting data, but I'm gonna concentrate on this first block here of uh, sleep. The importance of sleep. And I'm going to do that because sleep can really have an impact on how we think, in our mood, in our behavior of the whole family. It is at night that we process the events of the day. And if we're not sleeping well, these are not being processed. They kind of remain there. And we specifically look at a, a type of sleep called rapid eye movement, which is a key time for development of neurons and for cognitive. So we were able to do portable sleep studies in their own uh, house, which is great because usually this data is very subjective, but this is objective data. As the children were really more and more engaged with yoga, yes, yoga poses and mindfulness, uh, being in the moment type of exercises, they were sleeping better. The REM, the rapid eye, uh, eye movement part of sleep significantly increased. So the, the total sleep and cortisol seems to have played a role in that as well, meaning that those kids that had higher cortisol, um, which we know is more symptoms, benefited the most uh, of the yoga and the mindfulness. In terms of the brain function, we can see that those children that went through yoga and mindfulness, their amygdala activation decreased when viewing uh, uncomfortable uh, videos or pictures. So let me see how much time we have here. Oh, perfect. 
the third part of the talk, and what I want to do with all of you, uh, and you can do in the privacy of your own little Zoom square uh, at your home, is to really engage in some exercises uh, that involve breathing. When we breathe, we get more oxygen into our body, to our hemoglobin, and that goes, that is delivered to our muscle, and our muscle relaxes further. Breathing is also an anchor to the moment. So it's a mindfulness uh, type of thing. Uh, breathing is life, right? If, if we stop breathing, we die. So that means that the better we breathe, the better we live. So, so breathing really needs a lot of attention. And sometimes people say, yeah, but I'm breathing all the time. But you're breathing shallow breaths. You're not paying attention to them. You're not fully filling your lungs to full capacity. And all of that plays a role. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk a little bit about the importance of positive thoughts, right? So there are negative thoughts that we all have. And there are positive thoughts that we all have. Now, let me tell you a little bit about this. Negative thoughts are also called automatic thoughts because they come for free. Uh, we have them ingrained in our brain, in our limbic system, in our reptile uh, brain, because they have lived there for millions and millions of years. Um, Thoughts like something is going to happen to me, the lion is going to kill me, I better climb this tree. This type of thoughts have helped us evolve. So negative thoughts are automatic thoughts to the point that now when we may not be as much in danger, uh, we may still have them. Putting the pandemic aside, which has brought a bunch of considerable negative thoughts, right? So the best way of fighting a negative thought is with a positive thought. But guess what? Positive thoughts are not automatic. <laughs> positive thoughts require a conscious effort. Positive thoughts arise from our frontal areas of the brain, and this is the youngest part of our brain, only 50 million years uh, the frontal lobe has been developing. But it is very impactful in terms of being able to control the negative thoughts. And why do we want to control them? We want to control them because spiraling negative automatic thoughts are associated with depression, are associated with anxiety, and are associated with suicide risk. So they are to be taken very seriously. And in times like this, when there are negative thoughts that we need to take, we need to separate which of those are adaptive, right? Like I'm gonna be careful with X, Y, and C versus which of those are not. And sometimes that's not easy and we need to seek uh, professional advice to help with that. Okay, so in terms of breathing and how to increase the depth of our breath, I am going to just tell you something that is very simple, which is that we increase the depth of our breath. We're going to do 10 breaths together. And the first five are going to go as deep as one, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to come and make them less deep. Five, four, three, two, one. But while we're doing that, you should know that the diaphragm that the, the, uh, our diaphragm is activating our vagus nerve, which will help us calm our heart rate. So it does bring a sense of peace and a sense of calmness. So let me uh, perform for you a breath of one. One in, one out. A breath of two. One, two. Two, one, a breath of three. One, two, three. Three, two, one. When we breathe out, we want to breathe out slowly as if through a straw. And we want to make it, if we can make it slower than the way that we breathe in, the more powerful it also becomes. Let's all breathe in together. One, two, three. Four, four, three, two, one. I'm saying the numbers so that you know how I'm going. You don't have to do the numbers because it's better, easier to breathe without saying, without talking. So let's do the five breath without 
counting. It has to become part of a practice, part of a routine. If I gave you a guitar right now and told you, please play me a song and you don't play guitar, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. But if you take lessons and a year from now, I ask you to play guitar, you probably will. So the same thing with positive thoughts, the same thing with breathing, the same thing with having a mindfulness uh, practice. How to teach this breathing to children? There's uh, the idea of a starfish, the hand where you breathe in and you breathe out. Will you breathe in and you breathe out? Will you breathe in and you breathe out? And you don't do it as fast as I'm doing it. You actually take your time and breathe in very slowly. And breathe out very slowly. And then come back. Kids love this exercise. Uh, so you can do your own. You can teach this one to the kids. You can do it together with the kids. Or you can do a separate one. Um, in times, you know, in, 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 in terms of being in the moment, it is really activation of our senses. Our senses are really the windows to, to our nervous system, to our brain and, and the rest of our neural system. And it is in our senses actually that many of the cues actually reside and, and live. So if we wanna be mindful for a second, we can think of five things we can see. Consciously tell to yourself, I am seeing this, I am seeing this, I am seeing a chair, I am seeing a book, I am seeing a portrait, I am seeing a table, I am seeing a laptop. Four sounds that you hear. I hear that car passing, I hear the leaves falling. Three things that you feel. I can feel my shirt, I can feel my shoes, I can feel this chair. Two things that you can taste, mm, something salty, something sweet. One thing you can smell, which is not too difficult in, in the spring here in California at this time. So the breathing, the mindfulness, I'm not gonna do yoga, but a mountain pose that can help us centralize and be centered are all these things are having an impact on our brain and how our brain functions and how we sleep at night and how we process the events of the day so that our backpack doesn't get too heavy. And so that we alleviate our allostatic load because the allostatic load for all of us this past year has been very heavy. And it is very important for all of us to engage in self-care with these practices. Um, with my good friend, John Redker, uh, we actually edited a book on applied mindfulness uh, and approaches for children and adolescents and how to do this at school, how to do it in nature, how to do it in different settings, in the clinic with different types of kids. Very, very uh, helpful. Book. And then in terms of everything I have talked about, youth exposed to traumatic stress uh, with the American Psychiatry Association, I also edited this other text. And I think you will all have access to these slides so you can refer to them after that. I want to thank my team, right? Uh, all of this work couldn't be done by one person. So it takes a, a lot of people that are very dedicated and, and work really hard and have their heart right place. And those that actually support the work that I do and anonymous donors from the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital Foundation, from Stanford Healthcare, the Evans Foundation, the National Institute of Health, NARSAT, AFSP, and the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. So 
Thank you. Thanks to all of them and thank you all. And now we're gonna open it up for questions. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Karyon, for the wonderful presentation. Now we are open to Q&A session. Um, we have a question um, come, coming in specific for some of the, um, the data, actually. Um, first question is regarding that U curve. Okay. So the question is, uh, in the curve that you showed, optimum stress, I saw anxiety and dep depression on opposite ends but could high stress situation that is chronic high levels of anxiety then actual, actually lead to depression rather than low stress depression? Yes, it can. Being on that second half of the curve can certainly put us at risk to develop a depression and an anxiety that impacts our function. So all of us as human beings get sad right, and can get uh, also uh, anxious. And anxiety is just part of, of who we are. It's, it's wired in, right, in those negative thoughts that I was talking about. But how do we know when it's more than that? Well, the rule of thumb is that you look at three areas of function. You look at your interpersonal relationships, you look at your work, and you look at your level of distress. If those are affected, then yes, there is something more serious here that we need to address. If not, then probably, if, if, it's, not causing, if it's not causing impairment of function, then it's probably on the first part of the curve, right? It is, it's just part of anxiety about that test that I'm, get, that, that, that I'm gonna have and, and so forth. Yeah, okay, thank you. And the next question is, um, is also related to um, one of the slides here. Is HPA acid and uh, cortisone secretion that causes the system to shut down, as you mentioned, affecting cardiovascular system? Is it at all thought to be a part of what we see with the POTS um, syndrome? Um, it, it does play a role. There, there are many neurotransmitters in the nervous system. The reason I highlight the cortisol one is because cortisol really plays a role in the fight or flight response, which is our normal response to a threatening experience. Now, fight or flight doesn't come that easy to children. They are too small, so they cannot fly, and they are very dependent, so they cannot fly. They cannot say, I'm out of here, I'm going to the movies or something like that. You know, they're stuck. They're stuck in that situation. So sometimes the reaction that we see in them is freezing. They freeze. Uh, we also call that sometimes dissociation, right? Kind of pretending that you're not there, pretending this is really not happening. Um, and sometimes dissociation can be adaptive, but sometimes it, it can become a problem as, as well. And cortisol at high levels, having an effect in the hippocampus is probably related to that uh, dissociation. But the sympathetic system and the parasympathetic system, which are part of the autonomic nervous system, are also part of this shutdown that is being referred to in the question. And, and the cortisol communicates with that system as well. So when cortisol goes up, epinephrine goes up as well and sends messages to many different organs and many different vessels. Okay. Um, a next question is, um, as for the breathing practice, can singing very loud help? Can singing a loud help? can seem very loud, help? If you live alone. <laughs> I believe that uh, probably you, can. Uh, you probably can uh, help you. You have to make sure that everyone around you uh, likes it too. Um, well, um, yes, yes, I, 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 I think, 
but but it's, I don't think it's through the breathing mechanism. I think it's through the rhythmicity. We have found that rhythmicity, as in melody, as in music, listening to music or singing or, yeah. or hearing others sing, that that rhythm, that melody, um, is also something that anchors you in the present and can give you a state of well-being. Now, that is not all types of music. There, there, there is something about the rhythmicity, and I'm not an expert in that area, but I think it's like six hertz per second or, or something like this, that is like a key. Like for example, when you see a drop of water falling and, and you kind of almost get hypnotized by it because you're so relaxed uh, or hear drums, the same thing. So music has that rhythm within it. And, and I, would, I would think that singing does that too. And, and I'm sure it depends on the song, um, but yeah, that, that's probably a good thing. Okay, uh, next question is about um, the same question. Um, uh, how do you teach mindful breathing to a 60 year old that has no interest in joining in the exercise? I'm sorry, did you say six or 60? Six? Six, yeah. Oh, six, okay. 60 yeah. year old has no okay. interest. To practice the uh, mindful breathing, how can we? Well, I think the starfish, right, is yeah. something that captures the imagination of, of many of the young children. So we use that. Sometimes we talk to them uh, about an imaginary birthday and, and how many, how old is your friend? And you have to blow how many candles? And we engage them in things like that. So the more like a child you become and the more that you can play with the developmental level that you're working with, uh, and that includes the 60 year old, <laughs> uh, the, the more successful uh, you'll be. Okay. Um, next question is, if some traumatic memory continues to show up in our past, taking up attention and time, what therapy could we do to decrease that? Yes, so this is a very important question. I talked about some of the principles, but I'll, I'll tell you something that I think is key. In my team, we have a saying, and, and the saying is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, feeds on avoidance. It loves avoidance. So the more we avoid, the stronger, PTSD gets. So what that means is that if we really want to fight it, then what we have to do is approach it. So um, for this question, the way that we would approach is to identify what those cues are, what those triggers are, what those reminders are, and, and recognize which ones are threatening and which ones are neutral, right? I, I said most of the, them would be neutral, but if there's something that is dangerous, of course, you're not gonna get involved with that. But if you can expose yourself to things that give you fear because of their previous association with the previous traumatic experience, then that could be uh, very helpful. Okay. In terms, in terms of, of treatment, uh, there's, in addition to the Q, uh, center treatment that I mentioned. There's trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. There's prolonged exposure uh, for symptoms of trauma as well. Uh, and the story, the storytelling, the narrative seems to be like a cardinal component of many of the treatments. However, remember that curve uh, that, that I show and, and the decline of symptoms that happens by just learning about the subject. Many of the symptoms may be linked by your concern that there might be something wrong with you. When in fact, 99.9% .9 of us have a system that will respond exactly the same way with the right amount of allostatic load. And uh, so it's, it's almost not a disorder. And in fact, many people 
do not use the term post-traumatic stress disorder, but refer to it as post-traumatic stress injury, almost as when you, you know, hurt your arm and, and it gets dislocated and you have to go to the emergency room and they have to put it back. It's gonna hurt, but it's going to heal, right? If you, if, if you avoid it and pretend that the arm didn't get hurt, it's gonna get worse. So, so, so it's more of an injury of that uh, 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 fight or flight response, right? Of that cortisol and of all those systems than anything else. And the first step for healing is recognition and acceptance. Okay. So Dr. Karen, we, we are at 7.30 uh, um, we have uh, so many questions coming. Um, can we pick uh, the last one, the one more? Yes, sure. So um, the question is, um, I think this is probably gonna be the last one because it's already 7.30. Okay, so the question is how we can release the fear and shock our body and the cells have remembered. Any tips? Um, some exercises? Yeah, I, I think for the relief of fear or for the relief of shock, mindfulness is particularly helpful. And being in touch with your body with yoga is also particularly helpful. So I, but, but it really has to be a practice. It, it almost has to be daily. You know, it cannot be something that you do like whenever you think of it or once a week or it has to be a daily practice, just like brushing your teeth. Okay. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Karen, for the wonderful presentation and uh, Q&A. Um, I'm going to put up, um, share some information uh, for the foundation. Uh, let me share some information. Um, I want to take this opportunity just to um, share uh, with everyone that the Allen Hoop Foundation, about Allen Hoop Foundation scholarship, uh, we will offer the scholarship to students who are enrolled in the high schools in the Pleasanton Unified School District in Pleasanton, California. And applicants should be high school seniors going to colleges or universities and planning to major in fields of psychology, psychiatry, or neurosciences. And please uh, check out Ellen Hoop Foundation website for more details. And please also stay tuned for the future Ellen Hoop Foundation Mental Health Lecture Series webinars. And uh, we also have uh, some um, information that we'd like to share. These are some useful resources uh, for mental health related um, from the National Institute of Mental Health, um, some information regarding the uh, uh, about drugs and um, some clinical studies, uh, those information. Um, so I'm gonna stay on this uh, page and for, for people to, to take a note and um, take a shot of the screen. And we'll also put it on our website for, for you to, uh, to come back to to take the, uh, the information. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carrion, for giving a wonderful presentation. You know, I, I learned a lot from this and uh, good to know that uh, the information about neuroplasticity uh, and, um, and thanks everyone to join and especially thanks to MHACC and the Chinese interpre interpreter, uh, Ida and Barbara, for the Chinese interpretation. Um, with that, I'm going to close the event. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye, stay healthy and uh, stay safe.